Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Good morning. Welcome to worship under the roof here at Westminster Presbyterian Church. It would be worship under the oaks. And I knew when we made the decision to move inside uh, yesterday when we were looking at the forecast um, and feeling the mud beneath our feet that it was just going to guarantee that we would have beautiful weather this morning. So you're welcome. Thank you, thank you, God. Um, And so welcome to everybody uh, who is joining us here um, in the sanctuary. Welcome to those of you who are joining us through our live stream on Facebook. Welcoming to you who may be uh, worshiping on YouTube at some other place or time. Know that you are uh, part of God's family and that you have a place here. There are announcements at the bottom of your bulletin. Also on the back of that bulletin, you'll see a little QR code, which looks like a barcode that we're seeing in places all over the place uh, these days. If you uh, use, if you put your smartphone camera over that code, it'll take you to a link where you can register your attendance with us and uh, ask to find out more about the ministries of Westminster. Or if you want to do it the old-fashioned way, you you can uh, look towards the center row of each uh, pew toward the center aisle. There are welcome cards, and you can note your uh, presence with us by filling out one of those cards and then just put it back in the basket, and we will uh, collect those um, at the end of the service. We will be uh, partaking in the sacrament of the Lord's Supper this morning as part of worship. Uh, So if you did not get a communion pod, um, Anne has them in baskets right there. If you can just sort of let her know if you need a communion pod. We will have a brief congregational meeting after worship uh, to elect elders for our next uh, class on the session, and so all members are encouraged to stay for that congregational meeting. 
There are announcements, like I mentioned in your worship uh, bulletin, if you are interested in joining Westminster Presbyterian Church, we will have a group joining the church officially as members soon and are beginning a new members class, and so talk to me if you would like to be part of that class. Then after our uh, congregational meeting, we are going to have a reception in the fellowship hall with uh, food and drinks and and fellowship in honor of Seth Luna, who is our new uh, music director and organist. And you will have a chance to meet Seth. As you can see, he is gifted at not just the organ, also the piano, also as a singer, also as a trumpeter, which I really did not know when we, uh, when we first hired him. Um, prior to coming to Westminster, Seth served eight years as music director and organist at St. Mark's Episcopal Church in Barrington Hills, Illinois. He's also served as a service technician for Burhouse Pipe Organ Builders. He holds a Bachelor of Music in Organ Performance from Wheaton College, and he is currently one year deep uh, in his Theology of uh, Sacred Music Master's Program at Perkins Theological Seminary. Um, And Seth is not just passionate about music, but theologically rich Christian worship as well. And not just music and worship, but he's passionate about people. Seth is friendly, caring, and a joy to work with and to be around. And we are so, so pleased um, to have him and lucky to have him here. So please uh, stick around after worship as we honor uh, Seth. Well, friends, this is the day that the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. I invite you now to center yourselves, your minds, and your bodies as we prepare to worship God. One way we do that is by focusing on our breathing, by breathing in deeply together. And breathing out. We breathe God's Holy Spirit in, and we breathe out our worship and our praise. Today's call to worship is a call and response. So each time I read a line, your response will be, Jesus is Lord. Again, each time I read a line, your response is? Good, you've got it. Please rise in body or in spirit for our call to worship. We have come to worship and proclaim the truth. Jesus is Lord. We proclaim of the one who declares release to the captives. Jesus is Lord. We proclaim of the one who shares bread with the hungry. Jesus is Lord. We proclaim of the one who promises justice to the oppressed. Jesus is Lord. We proclaim of the one who brings good news to the poor. Jesus is Lord. We proclaim of the one who heals the afflicted. Jesus is Lord. We proclaim of the one prosecuted by religious leaders. Jesus is Lord. We proclaim of the one executed by the state. Jesus is Lord. We proclaim of the one who conquers death forever. Jesus is Lord. We give, we give thanks for our faithful Messiah and friend. Jesus is Lord. Let us worship God.
Let us pray. God of unconditional love, the beauty of creation reveals your majesty. Words fail to evoke your power and glory, yet above all else, we are moved to offer worship and praise because of your compassion. Even in your perfection, you listen to us. Even in your self-sufficiency, you are moved by us. Even knowing your divine providence, you respond to our prayers. Even in your holiness, you welcome us into your presence. Thank you, God of the universe. Amen. You may be seated. After considering the perfect love of God, it eventually dawns on us how far we fall short. So we rejoice, rejoice that the inexhaustible mercy of Christ gives us the courage needed for us to be honest with ourselves and with God. We ask forgiveness for our mistakes and confess our sin, not to wallow in guilt or obsess over the past, but to celebrate the freedom and peace of God's future. In humility and faith, let us confess our sin. God who listens, we live in a time both of hopeful possibility and paralyzing anxiety. Hear us as we confess the ways our fear and desire for control have led us to mistreat our family, co-workers, neighbors, and strangers. You call us to seek justice on behalf of the marginalized and oppressed. Yet, we are obligated to care for and protect the ones we love most. Hear us as we confess the ways we place social obligation above Christian calling. While your gospel promises us security and abundance, news outlets constantly warn of danger and scarcity. Hear us as we confess the ways we act in fear and self-preservation, just in case. You know our desires and motives of God. Hear the personal prayers of hearts as we bear our whole selves before you. Amen. Brothers and sisters, God's mercy is deeper than the ocean. God's love is wider than the sea. In the waters of baptism, our sins have been thrown into the bottom of the deep, and we bear them no more. In these waters, we are born as new creatures, chosen, freed, forgiven in Christ's love. Children of God, hear and believe the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen.
You, did, you told me to come <laughs> up. <laughs> Friends, just as we have been forgiven in Christ, so also should we forgive one another. The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Also with you. I invite you to share signs of Christ's peace and greet your neighbors in Christ's name. <laughs> In preparation to hear God's word in scripture, let us pray. Gracious God, we do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from your mouth. Make us hungry for this heavenly food, that it may nourish us today in the ways of eternal life through Jesus Christ, the bread of heaven. Amen. Today's reading is from Matthew, Mark 15, verses 10 through 28. Listen for God's word. Then he called the crowd to him and said to them, Listen and understand, it is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but is what comes out of the mouth that defiles. Then the disciples approached and asked him, do you know that the Pharisees took offense when they heard what you said? He answered, Every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted will be uprooted. Let them alone. They are blind guides of the blind. And if one blind person guides another, both will fall into a pit. But Peter said to him, Explain this parable to us. Then he said, Are you also still without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into the mouth enters the stomach and goes out into the sewer? But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart. And this is what defiles. For out of the heart comes evil intentions, murder, adultery, fornication, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile a person. But to eat with unwashed hands does not defile. Jesus left that place and went away to the district of Tyre and Sidon. Just then, a Canaanite woman from that region, came out and started shouting, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. 
My daughter is tormented by a demon. But he did not answer her at all. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she keeps shouting at us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. He answered, It is not fair to take the child's food and throw it to the dogs. And she said, Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered her, Woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was instantly healed. The Word of God. Thanks be to God. So on today's episode of Why Is That in My Bible, we have the story of Jesus and the Canaanite woman. Today's episode stars Jesus Christ, also known as the perfect Lamb of God, the Alpha and Omega, the Lamb of Judah, the Prince of Peace, I could go on. Starring alongside him is the Canaanite woman, also known as not one of God's people, enemy of the Hebrews, the quintessential outsider. In today's episode, Jesus and his disciples have made their way into the region of Tyre, which is kind of like the neighborhood on the other side of the tracks from Galilee and the places where Jesus did most of his ministry. It is a heavily Gentile region But evidently, they are there to minister to the Jews who do live in the area. As they're walking along, this non-Jewish Canaanite woman approaches them. And if you have been paying attention not only to the Bible, but even news of current events, Canaanite is a pejorative term. She starts crying out, frantically for mercy. Jesus' reaction is probably a reaction that is familiar to a lot of us. Think of what you do when you are in a different neighborhood. Maybe you're downtown on a date with a loved one or family or going to an event in Fair Park. All of a sudden, a stranger approaches in some sort of heightened emotional state, seemingly wanting something from you. I think most of us have been there, and I imagine the way Jesus played it was to just sort of look straight ahead. Maybe he put his headphones in or took out his phone like he was responding to a call or to a text message. He shows no recognition. However, This woman won't be deterred. After all, her daughter's been afflicted by a demon. She's not only frightened, she's desperate. Meanwhile, the disciples are probably looking around, trying to see if there is a police officer nearby whose eye they can catch. (laughs) They should have been in Devonshire this morning. They want Jesus to have nothing to do with her, to tell her to get lost. But finally, Jesus responds. I imagine him sounding very professional. I was actually a case manager at the Stewpot downtown, a homeless social services agency, before I uh, started serving a church here in Dallas. And I think of the way that I would communicate to someone who was asking for the Stewpot's financial assistance but didn't qualify. So the Canaanite woman says, Lord, help me. And Jesus responds, I'm sorry, ma'am. The stated policy of this program is to minister to the lost sheep of Israel in this region. Unfortunately, you and your family do not qualify for the Son of Man's healing assistance at this time. We do apologize and on the way out can give you a referral list for other agencies in the area. But this woman 
is determined. She knows that nothing is just going to be given to her. She's learned that you have to be your own advocate. You have to be pushy. After all, exceptions can always be made. No, I will not go away, she says. I know who you are. You could decide that I'm eligible if you wanted to. You could help me if you wanted to. After all, you are the Son of God. So I'm going to hold you to a higher standard. I demand that you be a better God for me than who you are being right now. And Jesus says, ma'am, I'm not going to discuss this with you any further. If your children were starving to death, would you take the food out of their mouths just because there was some dog on the floor begging for it? And in that moment, our allegiances get reversed. And in the woman's response, we see what she is really made of. Perhaps, ironically, Jesus, fully God, fully human, has just literally dehumanized her. No doubt, he is just the latest authority figure to call her a welfare queen or bring up her criminal record, or her past drug use, or sexual partners, or ask why on earth any person who was responsible would have so many children in the first place. So she could be forgiven for losing her cool, but instead we see her discipline, her wit, her strength, that perhaps is not only human, but even divine. You have a point, the woman replies. But not even all the rules and the policies and the so-called theology that you hide behind can keep the dogs from snatching up the scraps that fall on the floor. And then something unprecedented happens. Our hero, the Messiah, who never loses a theological debate or a rhetorical exchange, who goes toe-to-toe with the lawyers and the Pharisees and the experts and just embarrasses them, changes his mind. You have great faith, Jesus says. It will be done as you wish. Many people who have analyzed this story have insisted that we take it at, have insisted that it can't be taken at face value have said that there must be something about this story that we're missing. Jesus can't just be changing his mind. No, he he must be testing her. Or, Or maybe he was testing his disciples, they say. He knew how it was going to end. Jesus was in control the whole time. He just wanted the disciples to be uncomfortable and and wrestle with their own prejudices. Well, that's interesting, I guess. But even if this conversation was all some sort of cosmic test or plan that Jesus was secretly in control of, that does not change the basic facts of the story. A marginalized woman who was desperate, whose daughter was suffering, came to Jesus and to his disciples pleading for help, and Jesus' answer was no. He turned her away and called her a dog in the process. 
I don't care how you spin it. I don't think any rabbi or pastor would put this in their scrapbook of proudest moments from my ministry. So how did it get into our Bible? I think the reason this story is part of our sacred text is because the Spirit can use it to give an important lesson for the church. We struggle to square this story with the Jesus we know who welcomes sinners and keeps company with prostitutes, who withholds judgment from adulterers and offers healing and hope to Jew and Gentile alike. However, perhaps it does sound similar to the church that many of us know. The church that is suspicious of women in leadership. The church that continues to be embarrassingly segregated by race. The church that is dedicated so much of its time and energy to dehumanizing LGBTQ folks. Recent nationwide Pew surveys reveal that American church membership and participation has been declining steadily in recent years. And if you've heard me say that once, you've heard me say it a thousand times. But the studies show the reason why is not because we have rejected belief in a higher power or lost our sense of wonder at the universe. Quite the opposite, more and more Americans in recent years report valuing the spiritual life. Like countless other religious leaders, I'm interested in trying to understand this phenomenon, so a while back I decided to use Facebook to ask my friends if they were not part of a community of faith, why not? I was surprised by some of the answers I got. One friend from college who uh, one friend from college said his Christian faith was perhaps the single most defining characteristic of my life as a teenager, but as an adult, hanging out with church people feels kind of like hanging out with people that I knew from high school. They don't understand me for who I am now. Other friends described fleeing churches where there was no freedom of thought, where doubt and questions were met with hostility. And still others told heartbreaking stories of abuse and bullying at the hands of fellow church members and even leaders. One woman, a former member of a Presbyterian Church USA congregation in Texas, shared that her daughter had been assaulted and bullied by another member of the church's youth group. When they went to the pastor about it, he refused to act and even tried to rationalize why the daughter would have been susceptible to bullying. So then they took the matter to the session But the session also refused to do anything. They said it wasn't their place to insert themselves into a private matter between two teenage girls. The family ended up leaving the church. And in the same way that we don't expect to hear our Jesus act the way that he did in this scripture reading Many of us are shocked and surprised when we hear about a congregation acting this way. And yes, others of us aren't surprised at all. And that's why, like the Canaanite woman in these situations, we cannot take the church's no for an answer. 
We must continue pushing, striving for, demanding a better God, a better gospel than what the church is preaching. A God who lives up to the promises that God's house is a place of welcome for all nations and peoples. That the humbled will be exalted and the proud will be humbled. That love never ends. That in Christ there is neither male nor female, Jew nor Greek. That the indebted will be forgiven. That the prisoners will be released. That the chains of injustice will be broken. And all tears will be wiped away. And that loving your neighbor as yourself is literally a greater commandment than any verse in the Bible used to justify excluding gay people or women or immigrants or non-Christians from full participation in the life of God. Sometimes we church folks complain about a culture that is spiritual but not religious but let me suggest it would be more faithful for us to reckon with the ways the church is too often religious, but not spiritual. In other words, we have to admit sometimes that we are so tied to our traditions and structure and history, so afraid of rocking the boat and upsetting the apple cart, that we close ourselves off to the radical, free, new thing that the Holy Spirit is doing in the world. Because Scripture this morning promises that when Jesus or the church or whatever powers that be refuse to help the needy or stand up for the bullied and marginalized, God is, in fact, bigger and better than that. Like the Canaanite woman, we must demand a more faithful gospel. After all, right there in verse 28, that's what Jesus himself says that great faith looks like. I'm friends with a couple who live in Arkansas. A few years back, they were visiting different churches when the state legislature passed a law that prohibited cities from making ordinances to protect LGBTQ folks from discrimination. It was all over the news. People were talking about it across their state and beyond. Not unlike the abortion bill and the voting bill and the handgun bill that were all recently passed in our state legislature. However, in most of the churches that my friends were visiting, there was silence. There was nothing. Most, including the local Presbyterian church, ignored that front page headline entirely. Meanwhile, the churches that did discuss it almost universally supported the law and expressed contempt for the gay community. My friends were discouraged and saddened But they did hear about one church whose pastor and leaders had said that the law was wrong. They were eager to visit, but sure enough, on the Sunday before they went, the congregation split over that very issue. A large number left. On the Sunday that my friends went, and for many Sundays after, a dark cloud of grief was hanging over the congregation, then half the size that it was before. 
But they kept going. And in the months that followed, the Spirit went to work. Rather than be chastised by this apparent mistake and play it safe, that pastor and those church leaders continued to speak out on moral issues, even if they were controversial. Meanwhile, that congregation began to develop a core identity, a distinct notion about justice, a sense of mission oriented to defending the marginalized. They had this fire and this purpose that they lacked before. And slowly, the congregation began to grow, both numerically and spiritually. Of course, they're by no means a perfect church. My friends would be the first to tell you that. But they feel at home there. And they're not sure it would have happened without that period of conflict, of pain and loss, without the audacity of some members of that congregation to demand a better God. Amen. Thank you.
Friends, before uh, the invitation to the table, I did want to uh, share two prayer concerns for you. I meant to mention this at the outset. Max Tanner died last Tuesday morning, a member of this congregation who had been a member of John Calvin Presbyterian Church. Uh, He had been ill for um, a while and had been on home hospice. His service is going to be at Restland with uh, Carolyn Smith, the former pastor of John Calvin, uh, presiding. That service is going to be at 2.30 on this coming Tuesday at, uh, at Restland um, Funeral Home. Also want to uh, ask for... Um, Prayers for, is it Sandy Marlowe, friend of Carlene uh, Tiffany, who had a terrible accident and is now um, on life support in the hospital. Uh, So prayers for Sandy. Um, During the great prayer of great thanksgiving, there will be an opportunity if you have other uh, people to pray for to uh, voice those prayers. Well, friends, this is the joyful feast of the kingdom of God. It is written that they will come from north and from south and east and west and gather at God's table. At this table, all are welcome. At this table, all are invited. Those who desire Christ are invited to meet Christ here. At this table, we don't receive scraps, even if it's just a gluten-free little wafer. This is a foretaste of God's heavenly banquet, where there is abundance, where grace overflows. Let us now go to God in prayer. Holy and merciful God, You are great and indeed worthy of praise. We praise your name and we lift our hearts up to you, giving thanks for the way that you created the entire universe from nothing, that you made each one of us in your image, male and female, you created them. We give thanks for your compassion, which has extended throughout the ages in ways that we still struggle to comprehend. We give thanks to your word, which came to patriarchs, to prophets, to writers, to kings, and which finally came in the form of your incarnate Son, Jesus Christ who was born to the Virgin Mary, who showed everyone what it means to have true compassion, to listen, to be moved, to have one's mind changed, to offer grace upon grace and healing and justice to all who have been marginalized or oppressed. We lift our hearts up to him and up to you alongside all of the saints on whose shoulders we stand, the church across space and time who sing your praises at your heavenly banquet. We remember today those who have died in the faith, friends and loved ones who we join now spiritually at your table. We also remember those on earth who are in special need of your care. We ask that you would be with Ann Tanner and with all who love Max. We pray for Sandy and for her healing. We ask that you would be with all who are homeless. We pray for our session as they journey forward on a path unknown. We ask your blessing on our mission study team, which seek to discern the way your spirit is blowing in an uncertain world. We pray for our renovation team, which is working so hard to make our building ready to be an asset for our community. We ask your blessing on the dogs and the owners of Westminster Dog Park, 
on the families of Westminster Preschool, on all of our neighbors and local businesses. We ask that you would be with and watch over the police officers, the local officials, the local Boy Scout troop, the community gardeners. We ask that you would be with our cantors who are getting some time off this summer, that you would bless all of our mission partners, the Presbyterian Children's Home, Austin Street Center, the Bridge, North Dallas Shared Ministries, and all those who seek to help the least of these. Hear us as we lift up the names of those who are on our hearts in need of your healing and love this morning. Holy God, we give you thanks for your Holy Spirit, who intercedes with sighs too deep for words when we do not know how to pray. We ask that your Spirit would be moving here now, that it would move at this table, that this bread would truly be the body of Christ, that this cup we share would truly be the cup of salvation in Christ's blood and that we, as the people gathered, would be Christ's body, holy, chosen, forgiven, nourished for service in his name. Hear us as we pray together the prayer he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And so friends, at this table, we remember on Jesus' night before his arrest, he was at table with his disciples. And there with them he took bread and broke it. And gave it to them, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup and said, This cup is the new covenant, which is sealed in my blood, poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, remember me. For as often as we eat the bread and drink the cup, we proclaim Christ's saving death until he comes again in glory. And he is coming. These are the gifts of God for you, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. I invite you now to uh, enter into this time of communion, of offering, of prayer together. You uh, can separate the wafer from the cup by removing the film, and then there's another layer of film to uh, separate the cup from that layer. I do invite you to share communion with those that you are next to by offering uh, the body of Christ, the blood of Christ for you, so that this is not just an individual act. Um, During this time, you can sing, you can pray, you are invited to make a gift to Westminster Presbyterian Church, either uh, by writing a check or leaving a gift in one of our offering boxes, um, or uh, by giving through Venmo at West Presby. Let us be one body of Christ as we share communion together.
Let us pray. Holy and merciful God, accept these our offerings which we present to you. Accept these our lives which we offer to your service. Thank you, O God, for filling us with the bread of heaven and the cup of the new covenant. Strengthen us now to truly be your body. Send us out into the world to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with you. Amen. Brothers and sisters, go out into the world and, not, and do not be afraid to demand a better God than the one the church sometimes offers. And as you go, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with all of you now and forever. Amen.